Hello ladies and gentlemen and Merry Christmas. Welcome to episode number two of the LI Pod. Uh, in this episode we have Sebastian de Chavez and Scott Steele. In this episode we speak about the last three games of the Cup, including that unfortunate loss away to Cornish Pirates. We also talk about the recent milestones that each player has achieved, uh, with Scott Steele getting 100 appearances for London Irish and Sebastian Chavez uh, reaching 50. We also speak a little bit about their time at Leicester together and the culture change between going from that club to London Irish, as well as diving into the questions that you guys have sent in. I'd just like to say thank you to every single person that sent in a question. I thought they were fantastic. We really got stuck into them. We also speak to Scott and Seb about the pressing issue at the moment of the ring fencing of the Premiership. Obviously, this is something that may affect us in the future. Hopefully it doesn't. However, you get to see what these guys think so without further ado, here it is, episode number two. So here we are, episode number two, and we are here with Seb de Chavez and Scott Steele. How are we doing today? Very well, yeah. Yeah, got a big day planned, so yeah. pretty excited, energy's nice, so yeah. Yeah, we've got our Christmas meal for anyone who doesn't know this evening, uh, this afternoon, yeah. uh, and then obviously we go, we'll go on our merry ways to our individual socials, uh, which we'll get on to in a bit. I think we kick off, I think... Uh, First of all, let's talk about the weekend. Um, so you were there, said you had a rest week. Yeah. Not yeah, the result we were looking was, for? No, it wasn't ideal. Um, boys really disappointed with how it went. Um, I think at the end of the day, we, we weren't quite on it and they played the conditions which were pretty horrendous. Um, since when we got down to Penzance, I think it rained pretty much non-stop until kick-off and the pitch was very heavy, windy. Um, and I think obviously they're sort of used to them elements obviously playing there um, every second week so I think yeah we sort of took our time to get into the game and fair play to them they're, they're hard to beat on the day they're a good team um, work hard for each other but I think um, you know boys looking back at it um, we were off a bit and they, they were up for it and you know you can't, you can't turn up to games like that in this league because you'll, you'll get punished no absolutely it's, it's funny when I was talking to their analyst went for coffee uh, before the game and we were talking about that that yeah we I think we've got a strong enough team we've got a physical enough team that we can beat any team in this league but we have to be at that 90 to 100 percent to do it if we're not that we can get picked off yeah it's a sort of same old cliche we said last time we're in the champ that if we go away to teams it's their cup final sort of thing it's their biggest game of the year you get loads of people down there and it is it's tough it's intimidating at times when you go away to these places and this is the biggest game, you know, they put absolutely everything into it and as you say, if we're not if we're not on it and we're not playing the way we should be, then it's gonna be very difficult. Yeah. Also, there's also been examples of where, you know, Coventry and then the season and like other teams really push us and then the next week they get absolutely pumped, you know. So yeah. if that's where, you know, when the Irish is coming to town, coming on our own patch, yeah, we're gonna step up a little bit, you know, so they are good teams but they even stepped up a little bit more. For against us, so oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at the other two games we had against Pirates. Yeah, exactly. maybe the first one not so comfortable having two players off the pitch, but second one absolutely comfortable. Yeah. And uh, I think we went through that game being a hundred percent pretty much the whole way through in every area. Um, and yeah, like you said, it is other people's cup finals. It's tough. It's tough, and that's it makes our lives harder as well from an analyst point of view because we're analysing in this way. But they're an extra 10, 20, 30 percent when they play us, so it's so hard to. Yeah, you know, I, I also think with, the, with them sort of teams, if they're gonna, if we're analysing them and they're doing this stuff week to week, sort of like, they might as well throw in something that they might be risky, it might not yeah. work out, but the reward might be very good if it goes well. So then it's tough in that way to be like, oh, they might throw something that we've not seen just to try and you know, have a crack at us, pretty much what we would do if. In any league, if someone's at the bottom, the underdog, they might say, well, you know, we might as well go all out and go for it here because we're the underdogs and they've, they've got you know, more resources than us. But, um, yeah, it does definitely make it difficult going week to week with that, sort of playing against that mentality yeah. of we're going to put absolutely everything into win this as a cup final. And you can feel it with the crowds as well. They, when they're going there, it's, they know that, you know, it's one of the better teams in the league coming and they, they want to put... Absolutely, everything ends up happening. Absolutely, it's a scalp, right? It's an yeah. absolute scalp. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 
So in that game, obviously half time was, was was close. Was there anything specifically said in the changing rooms, or was it like, look, we know what the situation is. This is what we've got to do next. I think really it was one of them games where we knew what we wanted to do, it was just very difficult to try and actually, actually execute it with the, the conditions and you know they played really well, they're a well drilled team, they didn't really play much expansive stuff but when they did it, it paid off for them and I think we sort of tried to play a bit when we weren't on the front foot and played at the wrong time so I think in them sort of games it's more you know, the work rate of just, it's not going to be pretty, you've just got to make sure you're absolutely on everything you do and it's going to be physical, it's going to be tough. I think we were just off it, that sort of maybe 10, 10% in patches of the game, and that's when we let them in and they, they took advantage of it. Yeah, totally agree. Um, although we did lose, I do think there was some shining lights in that game. There was some, I think we didn't perhaps manage the conditions as well as we could have, um, but I think there were some quite, well, some very good individual performances. Um, I thought uh, Matt Williams had a great game again. Um, a real good break. I thought up front we were quite physical. Um, is there any other sort of lights you you can kind of pick from that game where you, you thought actually, um, yeah, we lost, but there are positives to take from this. Yeah, um, the way the boys fronted up, to be fair, like they're, they're a real physical pack, and as you say in the forward effort, there was some real good effort. Steve Barek, he was uh, very physical throughout the whole game, um, and the other boys in the area as well. Like Franco's just came back and he's played. Yeah. So it was a tough game for him to come back. And I think start. he played like 10 minutes last week and 18 yeah. minutes this week. So it's pretty <laughs> tough. And going into them conditions, if you're, he's going to be nervous coming back, never mind with all that on top of him. So and he's like 45 years old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, he got through, which was good. But I agree with you on Matty Williams. He was, he was outstanding again. He only got a couple of touches with the ball, but when he does, yeah. he beats players. like He's starting to be that player that will get people out of their seats with a lot. Oh, now he, he's on the ball, it's like, oh, what's happening? Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah, at the start of the year when Tom Parton was playing, it was oh, similar. very much same, yeah. So it's like, you're expecting a line, but you're expecting something. But Matty he just, he just seems to run through tackles. People just fall off him. Mm. They think, oh, he's tackled here. Like, thinking about the next phase of work, and he just keeps going. You know, that try the other week at home. Yeah, so and the try this week. Yeah, six boys tried to tackle him. Yeah. just falling off. And it was a very similar break this week, uh, and that was with one foot as well, as he had a boot taken off yeah. early doors. <laughs> He did Ran about it, thirty yeah. yards, stepped the guy with one boot in what can only be described as a bog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> your socks going to be so niggly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> on cool. the flip side, they've they've run into us and we've put big hits in. It sort of gets that sixty minute mark, and you can only keep that up for so long. They're up for it. It's the big game, and obviously our bench comes on. Their bench comes on. Whatever, but like in that sixty minutes, there's a lot of work that's went into like the last 20 if that makes sense in terms of we've grounded them down like yeah. made them work and then we just keep going and get a chance and then we like really push on like we say in the changing room before games like it might take 60 70 minutes to break this team down because they're so up for it and they're obviously a good rugby side so, yeah um so sometimes you can't come in frustrated but other times you come in going well we've thrown our best at them and they're just dealing with it at the minute we just have to keep going and keep persevering with this and Hopefully it'll crack, but um, I think that's. The, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think some people perhaps ha have. I, I don't want to say not no respect, but I think they feel the gulf between the Premiership and the Champ is so vast that we should just walk every team and, and comfortably. Whereas, like you say, there are some big physical teams out there that don't. Want, and like you say, we touched on it earlier. What will hit you that little bit harder? We'll want to push you back that little bit more. Um, and I think obviously we've got to play that day, week in, week out. Whereas they're like, you have teams that necessarily don't want to get promoted. Yeah. And they're quite happy to kind of maybe change in a team a bit more, yeah. swap out players. But oh, we've got this, these guys on this day, we have to have a full complement that day and we're going to give them everything yeah. we've got. You can tell with like the recruitment, and especially the last couple of years, of players making the jump from the Championship going into the Premiership. And there's examples of. Um, Boys doing it this year that have done really well. Like Jersey's been a good example of like, especially in the forward pack of players that go on from there, play there for a few years, and then they get picked up by prime teams, and then they're playing week in week out. Oh yeah. So to to say that oh it's quite a big like gap in between. I think that that's getting smaller and smaller, and also I think the main thing is squad size in the championships a lot smaller. So yeah. If you get a few bad injuries in key positions, I think that's when it drops off quite a lot. Whereas in the Premiership, if you 
have a few injuries in big positions, you've got guys ready, hungry to jump in, and they've got depth. So I think that is that's the main thing. And obviously that comes down to probably money and how much they're willing to put into the squads and stuff like that. So, yeah. Absolutely. But in terms of individual players, you could, I'm sure there's a lot of players that we play against that we come off the pitch going, oh, he was really good. Like, yeah. like we saw his clips and stuff, we didn't realise how yeah. like, fast or how like quick he is. Like He could definitely like play in the Premiership side and not look out of place whatsoever. Absolutely, I, t- I totally agree. I think a few of those are in Jersey. Um, uh, the winger uh, in Jersey really stood out for me. Uh, I can't remember, he's got the best name in, in rugby, in my opinion. Uh, Leroy Van Damme. Uh, South African. Yeah, I, I thought he was absolutely phenomenal in that game. And, and, and doing the um, analysis up to that, it was like, we can't give this guy space. If you give him space, he will. For sure, the name I've got, you've got, yeah. to, you've got to live up to it. You've got to live up to <laughs> it. <laughs> you're not great, then. <laughs> yeah. You're making so much stick, so. Absolutely. Let's go back even a bit, bit further to the Hartbury win. Again, it was one of those games where we were in it, we nailed them. This was this could be on and then conceding a try late. How how do you kind of go and obviously going into that game it was if we win this we've got a home quarter final. Uh, we beat them quite convincingly before, and obviously we've got them as our first game after Christmas as well. Yeah. So I think we're playing them three times in the space of about yeah, six weeks. So, yeah, so yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, how do you kind of get up for those games and and when you're winning? when you have that kind of margin at half time do you go out that second half right this is nil nil we're, 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 we're going to go again or is it like right we've got a big game next week do we think, I think about like it? in the when you you know in the thick of it I don't I think you're just thinking still not really nil nil but you're kind of thinking you know, let's keep this performance going it's because it does happen very it does happen not very often but it does happen quite often where you do smash teams and you still come into the change room after the game you're like were we were we amazing or were they just shit? You know, was it that's the that's the question we keep on asking ourselves is were we really good and they were good and you know it was a good contest and we came out on top or were we were we you know average and they were just worse than us type thing. So it's I think you don't like you can say it as much as you like no 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 but it's always hard when you have dominated in the first. Yeah, half. I think it was thirty eight nil at half time. Yeah, so. You know, the game's almost in the bag, that's all good, but now we need to focus on, there's always things you can work on. Even if you have the best half of rugby, there's, there'll always be something that you can work on. So you strive, get nice clear messages um, at half time and then go out and just keep that, you know, momentum going and that performance going. But it is tough to stay on it. And like you, like you say, like obviously milling teams is something, you know, it does say a massive that's say a statement yeah. how long into that game do you start or do you not think about it until after the game I'm just worried about my, my lungs exploding I don't really, <laughs> I don't really think about tries and all that but no it is something that you think of you know, you know especially when it gets to like the last 10 and they haven't scored you're like alright let's keep these boys out yeah but it doesn't it doesn't become the be all and end all you know it's just one of those you know it's almost just like a little Little slap to the face kind of thing. It's like, oh, it would have been nice to know them, but they scored one. We're not gonna, not gonna run go into the chain room and be like, oh, we were terrible today. They, it's just so like, you know, you're gonna ride the lows and you're gonna ride the highs as well. So, one try, we'll take it. If, if you know, bonus point win. Happy days. Also, with with the size of our squad and quality as well, if you're up as you say, thirty eight nil at half time, you're also thinking, right, well, if I went well, keep that going, like, because if I drop off here. It's, it's, it's an opportunity for maybe someone else to come in and they get their chance sort of thing, um, which you can't afford to do obviously. But it's just it's one of them things you're going right. This is this is going well. Just play as well as you can. Make sure the boys keep ticking over, and then if I can come off the pitch and be like, good win for uh, the team. But also I felt like I contributed well to the yeah. team um, because obviously as a coach, if you're watching someone, you go and say thirty eight nil up at halftime and they just sort of slack off. It's not. It's not sort of like that ruthless mentality that we, we talk about as a team and a group. So it's it's probably one of the, one of them things. Making sure it's it's easy to switch off when you're that that far ahead. But you know, like the, the better teams, like like so the All Blacks and stuff, are renowned for just being ruthless and just banging tries after try after try, regardless of how much they're up. And guys coming off the bench, they're the same. They're like, well, if we come on and the, and it sort of stops here, it's gonna look 
people are going to look at it and be like, oh, they were good until like substantive they make that impact. And yeah. Vice versa, if they come on after what I was talking about before, she ground down a team for 60 minutes and then the boys come off the bench. A lot of the time people go, oh, the bench were like really good, which they might be. But yeah. A lot of the work's been done previously by the other blokes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, it's always, it's always people kind of, uh, it's a lot easier, I think, in your position as well as a nine to come on when the front, their front row is wrecked yeah. and there's a lot more space around and you can be a little bit more darty yeah. and you'll find more gaps and you'll put people through more. Yeah. And they're like, why wasn't he starting? It's like, well, you haven't seen actually what's just yeah, happened yeah. for the last 60 minutes where you've had off. someone like Benny yeah. Meehan who has been running at them yeah. and passing it and, and basically mentally and physically fatigued yeah. them. And vice versa when you play. I mean, I think you're probably one of the most physical nines. Um, I think uh, Josh said it in our last podcast that you're basically a back rower playing nine. Uh, sometimes the way that Josh you hit, he, he plays as well. Yeah, that's, that's actually, yeah. no one else. No one else says that except my boss. Okay, so. self proclaimed. No one be else true. is going to boil. No, I do enjoy that side of the game. I do enjoy the confrontational side of it. And as you say, if I come on for the last twenty minutes of the game, obviously I'm going to be full of energy as anyone is in the last twenty minutes, and they're probably getting to the end of the game and they're tired and it's easier to play but you wouldn't be able to play like you do for that 20 minutes for the full 80 because it just be like it wouldn't be able to especially yeah. like you say with the way that I play in terms of like getting involved physically and stuff like that it would first of all I'd probably end up getting injured if I did that for every single minute that I played and then also doing it for the whole the whole length of game getting up and off the floor that takes it out of the other areas of getting to the breakdown so it's sort of like picking and choosing when to sort of um you know, not exert your energy, but like how much eff- how much reward you're going to get out of putting the effort in there rather than just picking and choosing and doing it for the whole eight minutes. So kind of looking about that in, in a bit more, uh, is there any time where you're, you're, you're maybe the nine that's going to be coming on and you're there kind of licking your lips going like, when I come on here, I'm going to absolutely tear it up. Or is there more like, ah, right, these are my jobs, this is what I've got to do. And if that happens, great. Um... There's a bit of you saying, right, you come on here, like I'm really, ex- like, I'm really excited, I've looked, I've, you're watching the game, you're waiting every minute and you're going, you're looking at them thinking, oh, well, they're a bit, they're a bit loose around the rock, they're a bit wide or something, I'm, I'm going to like exploit that. Or you'll look at the backfield and you'll say, or actually, they're only like dropping one at times, there's going to be space to kick. So that's a lot easier when you're coming off the bench, rather when you're in it, it's quite, obviously there's a lot going on, a lot to think about when you're actually, but if you're watching, um, you can just sort of see them things and pick it up. So then you get excited. You think, right, well, this this front row is is massive. He's really yeah. really massive. He's going to be slow. He's going to be tired. If he's defending two uh, two outside the rock, then all of a sudden going to have a crack sort of thing. But um, but on the flip side, I think also you're thinking if I come on and as the performance of the team goes down, it's going to be like reflected by the bench. So yeah. they're also just like. There is games to come on and be like, just keep doing the same thing, just get the ball away because the boys are doing well out wide and the boys are carrying well and you just, you don't want to come on and be like, right, well I want it to make it like the Scotch Steel show, like you just want to get the ball away and yeah. the boys will do the job. But then other times there are opportunities where you think, well, we're not, like last year in the Premiership, a lot of games would come on and we'd be that team that are down, so we're like throwing it around a bit more and having a risk and then games I'm thinking, I'm really going to try and have a snipe here because... I've not got much to lose. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. lose a bonus point, and that's it's it's sort of an easier position to come on because you come on and it goes well, you get back in the game. You come on and it goes the same way as it, as it has been. It's just oh well, they were better than us today. So yeah, thing, so. that's fair. There's no pressure in that terms, but obviously when you're playing against teams this year and we're winning, you come on. There's a bit more pressure to make sure that it keeps going. The Keep same going, way, especially not tie better. games. Yeah, Coventry, exactly. perfect example. I think. Yeah. Um, that was that was very tight, and I think there was a bit. Uh, it was probably actually one of the most hospitable crowds I think I've ever been at as well. It was um, yeah, intense, quite close around the pitch as well. Yeah, on all sides. And yeah, big stand. Yeah, there were loads. It was, it was good atmosphere. To play great, in. great atmosphere. Yeah. It's tough, but uh, how how do you as players you if you're at a place like that? I think Leicester's another place, which yeah. obviously we'll touch on later that you were both at. But again, a very the crowd were on you for 80 minutes. It, it must, do you kind of take that in and be like, oh, I'm going to show you, or are you like, do you just block it out and just, I've got a job to do, I'm in here to do that, I don't care about what the crowd are like? Um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say. I think most of the time, personally, I just block it out and just see it as, you know, almost background noise type thing. 
and you're like off the game, you come, it all comes back to you. It's sort of something that someone said, and you have a little laugh about it. But I mean, like you said, um, <clears throat> like Walford Road at Leicester, and um, then we had the double header at Twickenham last season. That was incredible. That, that, was, was, that is like the next level. So that actually, you know, adds something to you. Yeah, you know, it, it gives you that little bit of energy. It gives you a little bit more like. You know, you take a second and look around, you're like, well, this is, this then, is awesome, you know. Then, like, double header games is like, like, the few times in rugby when you're trying to speak to someone that's only five metres away from you and everyone's going mad. It's like, <laughs> this is what footballers must feel like. It's like, <laughs> because it's literally, you're running a support line, you're screaming at them, and it goes the other way, and you're like, did you hear me? Like, no, not a thing. And you're yeah. shouting as loud as you can. Yeah. And just like, and obviously, the person with the ball, it just makes you go that much, like, faster or whatever, it gets you up for it so much easier. Well, yeah, most of the crowds are like chanting mine and Steve's name. Yeah, it's really hard, and that's it. Yeah, you don't know who, 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 if you're meant to offload or it's yeah, just exactly. the crowd. It's yeah, just, you know, just so much Sebastian <laughs> being chanted around, so it's kind of tough. But no, but that's usually the chanting has to get off the bench. <laughs> yeah, get them off. But um, yeah, that double header was definitely it was just this really like special day. Obviously, it was our first first game back in the Prem and stuff, and yeah, the crowd was just crazy but when you go to these smaller grounds it's almost a little bit more you know hostile because like Steve says if at that at that Twickenham game or at you know the Walford Road or yeah. you know Allianz Park or Sandy Park you know someone someone shouting like oh you crap get off you're gonna hear it yeah but yeah yeah it's on those smaller grounds you're gonna hear it yeah he's literally <laughs> two minutes <laughs> yeah like two meters away from you like yeah. swearing at you so yeah it's, it's you know it's part and parcel of of the championship and I think it does have its own, you know, a little bit of like charm almost I guess. Yeah. Um but yeah, there are some pretty hostile fans on there. Yeah. <laughs> I do find that but I also find that it's it's very rugby like in regards to the eighty minutes they are hostile. As soon as that whistle goes, yeah. They're such good guys. And I and I found that I mean we had the coaches of um, Pirates give us a little care package for Christmas after the game. Uh, oh. like cheese, wine, port, a uh, couple of crackers, yeah. like like genuinely like wow oh thanks guys that's incredible like yeah yeah <laughs> um but like genuinely really nice guys i mean the bedford guys are really hospitable as well um i know uh two years ago they put on that irish night when we were down yeah i uh, had loads of people around um, i think it's just one of the you know the, the main values of rugby itself I absolutely you know, absolutely i think you you go at each other even players coaches or whatever it is you know you, you go to each other for 80 minutes, you know, and whatever happens on the field almost stays on the field. And that's, I think, one of the great things about the rugby. You still shake hands at the end. You still, you know, if you can, have a beer together. Stuff of that type of, you know, ethos type thing is, is, is quite awesome to be a part of. And I'm glad to hear that it's, you know, obviously going through the coaches as well, which is yeah, it's great. quite a nice touch. So I know um, uh, we've pretty much got pretty good relationships with all the championship uh, analyst and we'll always chat we go somewhere go for coffee the night before or the morning of nice. um we're always kind of like just chatting like it's very amicable very seems a bit more like personal sort of relationship yeah absolutely like, it's absolutely more down, it's more like your your club rugby sort of your old school club rugby like your if you go back home to your original club that you grew up playing it, it does have that feel about it where everyone so it's behind the team, and as you say, for that 80 minutes, it's hostile, but then you come off the pitch, and a lot of them, you sort of get a feeling that they're like, well, fair play, them lads really turned up today, yeah. they were really up for it, and yeah. vice versa, we'll play against teams and go like, for that, like 60, 80 minutes, that was like unbelievably tough, and you come off the pitch, and you just have that respect for someone that you're like, he's like a really good player, like, yeah. as we say, he will be able to play premiership if he gets a chance and stuff like that, so in that respect, I think it's a bit different, where it's like, you go to the Premiership and sort of everybody already sort of knows each other and they like go through the same sort of cycles and it's sort of same old and you do your job, they do your jo their job and it just sort of, after the game, just split and that's it. Whereas this yeah. is a bit more like you actually get to know each other a bit better. Sort of I do see that like um, in, after the game, when we're having food and after, there's always people like talking, even in the Premiership sometimes, like, I mean, you've got obviously our uh, force coach, uh, Josh Skimmington, who was at Leicester and... Um, yeah. Wasps, so he knows a lot of the guys he used to play with. So they do come in. There is a bit of integrate integration between yeah. times, which is nice to see. It's actually like, again, that physicalness on the pitch, but off it, it there's still that game balance, which is, yeah. I think, some people may see that going out of the game, perhaps, especially with people talking about the refs these days a bit more and 
but it's nice to see that it's still itchy behind the scenes as soon as the game's up it's have a, have a drink and have a chat at the end of the day like it's just your mates if you know what I mean yeah. like you've had previously it's the same sort of thing but um, yeah and sort of in other industries you don't try and smash them and like go through it that way but um, yeah at the end of the day it's just mates that you're catching up with in the do you find that though with people that you play against that you know you're like I'm going to slot you today there's yeah. that there's that kind of like there's a little there's bit more niggle in it or my I think that but it's more like depending who you're playing obviously on like if he's a back or a forward or whatever you just like just don't want to get shown up by him and I know that he's thinking <laughs> I just don't want to get shown up by him etc <clears throat> if you if something does happen straight away after the game you're like oh, I can't believe you've done me there <laughs> yeah. like, it's more more of that for me obviously but I would say as a forward you're thinking if I get a really good shot on him I'm going to remind him after the game straight away yeah yeah, yeah it's more I suppose yeah backs and forwards back Backs is more like, I hope he doesn't, you know, burn me on the outside or step me or yeah. something like that. Whereas forwards is like, almost sometimes, you know, I really don't want him to make a lineup because he'll be talking about, you know. Text. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, yeah, don't want to get sat down and tackle or clean up or something like that. So, you always going to have, you know, extra pair of eyes when you play against. It's like one of them, like, you'll get off the floor and someone will, like, keep keep an elbow like, on you or something like that. Yeah. You get a bit rattled, you turn around, you see them, they smell it, and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Been, it's cocked and you're like, no, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, I used to play against uh, Callum Green up at Newcastle and he was yeah. a blesser. I mean, he is like a very, very niggly player to play against, like really good at what he does, quite like underrated player for yeah. for like what he does and um, up at Newcastle running the line out and stuff and every time I play a game, it'll be like that, like getting held down on the floor extra and I'll be like looking around the ref and be like really annoyed and I'll turn around and see it's him and I'll be like, Oh, classic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just be smiling at me, and then after the game, it's all fine. And it's just one of them where you're like, oh, he's going out his way to try and annoy me here, and it's working. So, <laughs> so obviously, we finished now the cup run. Uh, six weeks, a lot of repetition, yeah. a lot of like. I know when I was doing the previews, it was I was doing something, and I was like, that's completely the wrong team. We haven't got it for another two weeks, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's completely mine now. Yeah. yeah um, and also just before the cup, we obviously played. Bedford, yeah, and right after the cup we played Hartbury, so and before we played Pirates, <laughs> exactly. So and then it comes into as we're saying before, like squad rotations and stuff. If we're trying to analyze, like, oh, they did this last time, and then it's like, but will he be playing? Yeah, will he be playing? Yeah, which we did find quite a lot of the teams would still end up putting a pretty similar team out. It'd be a few changes, maybe. Yeah, if, but I think it's more if they can afford to change it rather than um, yeah. if they fancy it or not, just because of maybe injuries or the size of the squad so um, whereas we had quite a big rotation in and out and we had guys coming back from internationals and stuff like that that needed to fit in so but we had quite a lot of changes which um, was good for the boys getting a lot of opportunity and then but also on the flip side like getting them combinations working smoothly straight away um, takes a bit more time than you probably like and that's, that's just going to happen but it's just the way it is sort of thing. Yeah you, you were saying about the internationals coming in I kind of felt a little bad for them because obviously they've been away doing internationals one rule then they've come into uh, the cup where they're trialling this new below their nipple line. and having to slot in and do that it must be quite it's quite difficult for them to yeah, I think especially that switch for the Samoan boys because they, yeah, they love to you smash know, they're, uh, you know digger shoulders their chest kind of hit and they're big hitters as well so yeah. if they you know if they get a little bit wrong it looks even worse than it is just because of the force that they, they tackle with. So, yeah. I mean, you can see they also put them off this year, big hits here and there, but it doesn't really look the same. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes, it's, it is tough for them to, as you say, go into also big international games and then, as you say, one more and then come here, and, you know, it's a bit different and, you know, that adjustment, that's something that's yeah. adjust real quick. Especially for them, like playing against other international national packs or players where it's like that line of physicality and then the, the rule of going high like it's so fine and if they don't do it then players are going to run through you sort of thing where you have to bar up and you have to hit high and stuff like that for them to come back and to just get that mindset changed just like yep yeah, done change it like, Which can, you, can, you can imagine probably the first 10-15 minutes is at the forefront of the mind and things like that but as fatigue sets in and muscle memory starts to go in where it just takes that one where you just forget and bang that's that's the one that perhaps I think you could like tell a lot with the reaction of players a lot of the time we, we've been watching a game or playing in a game and the ref just 
puts his hand out for advantage and you're thinking, I've no idea what he's put his hand out there for. And then you get to like look back at Eagles high tackle and you're like, was it? And you look back and it is with the law, it is high, but yeah. we're not thinking, oh, that could be, could be in the trouble. The tackle doesn't even really react. Yeah, to so yeah. yeah. Just, that's the thing. And the crowd aren't going like that because they're not used to the rules. So I do think it's, I think as well, like when, when you kind of going over the games and ones that are given high tackles and ones that aren't, I, th- I think the refs are in that position as well where sometimes they're like, Oh yes, tackle. Yeah. Because there's some tackles I'm going. I was like, I think it was the first one against Jake Shaft. It was a high tackle. Yeah. But yeah. In, in the in the new rules that they're trying, but it wasn't in normal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's like, well, it it seems like they kind of not pick and choose, but like suddenly they'll remember, and it's like, oh yeah, that's high tackle, and you're like, there's the same with like the the seatbelt tackle as well, and that's yeah. like coming in anything over the top, and that was even worse because it was like. A lot of them weren't done before, so it wasn't like they were going in to hit high and it was going there. It's like sort of if someone's got by you, especially if you're a taller guy, you're just reaching back and dragging them down. And it's like when they came around, like, well, I think of last year, a couple of years ago, I used to be like, like that's that's got to change because it's just the way that it happens sometimes. Yeah. But the sort of, I just, it just does. It's funny how it adapts so quickly and that happens. Um, but now, obviously, for us, we have to go back to the, the usual rules and it's just a bit of a weird one going like six games focus sort of doing it games obviously getting pinged a few times and now it's just like right done with that back to it's probably going to be worse when it gets to the quarterfinals semi-finals and finals yeah. if, if we get that far where it's going to be literally a group of four games one game new rule yeah. four get one game new rule it's yeah. it's yeah you're right it's a, you've got one week nipples, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Not in your professional life, anyway. Not your style. Guys, nipples. Yeah. 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 Um, so, obviously, yeah, we finished this cup run, and I think what's been good about this cup run is we've, like you said, our, our squad strength and depth is pretty good, and we've allowed some of the young bloods to, to come through and shine. Is there anyone that you've seen on, um, uh, in that senior academy or, or even this come in recently? Uh, Terrence, for example, that you've been like, wow, they. they they put their hand up here. This is this is gonna be tough. Yeah. So me and me and Seb played with uh, Terence when he was at Leicester a few years ago. So we um, we knew him and knew that he was a good player. Um, but I think the way that he's came back, his his skill set's a bit higher than it used to be, and he's he's really improved. So his first game especially, he came in and it's very difficult to pick up all the calls, and it's quite complicated. It's once once you're here for a few weeks, you crack it and it's fine, but. For the way that him would just turn up and play, where he barely knew guys' names, never mind what the call was and whatnot, and he still managed to play very well. So, likes of him, I think, Matt I think Isaac, well. Isaac's oh, yeah. done really well. Yes. Um, in these games, he does. He's one of those players that you know doesn't really seem to ever have a bad game, and I think once again, um, he's improved loads, and I think he's actually you know become a really really good player. He's played well in his last games. Jack Cook is also. Coming along nicely, I mean the chop master. Yeah, he's a bit like he's only about sixty five kilos anyway, but he can chop a tree after dinner. Much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, soaking wet. Um, but he's also you know come off the bench, really made good impacts and stuff like that. And you can even see it in training. They you know they train really well. All of the youngsters they yeah. train really well. And that pushes the whole squad to a higher level. So yeah, I think this block of games has done us really good in terms of going into the new year. Everyone's you know had. A good load of maybe three or four games. Guys who have played the first block of nine games have had weeks off and stuff like that. So going into the new year, you know, as as much as you can, you know, everyone's happy and got a little bit of game time, a little bit of rest. So hopefully that'll serve us against there as well. So it'll be really nice because he, he trains incredibly hard. So it's always nice to see boys who really put in the hard work get get a little bit out of it and stuff. And I thought, yeah, he's done really well. But yeah, another one as well, uh, he's on a new position, um, he came on uh, as Bobby Brand, but when he came on a uh, game uh, a couple of weeks ago, just the speed that that kid has is insane. Yeah, it's unbelievable. The footwork the, is ridiculous. The, he's just, even in training, we're doing one-on-one drills and stuff like that, and he's the worst person you come across, you're going... You try to like line up in the queue and sort of figure out who you've got, <laughs> and you try to like not get him, and it's just he's so low and explosive to the ground and he's aggressive as well so even if he does slightly get caught he'll he'll put a good friend out but as you say the speed and if you, it'd be your worst nightmare if you're 60 minutes in and you're a front row or like 
front five and you see him dart around the ruck, you just go, oh, like, God help me. Give it like, a rest. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Like, just, like, just, just pass it away. Yeah, Jamie's yeah. done a couple of boys in the shoot, yeah. you know, the phone box. And, um, yeah, I won't mention names, but Josh and Yanni, but there's <laughs> a, a few that have been done, you know, so, yeah, it's got ridiculous speed. Ridiculous yeah. Speed. I think Ben Loder as well, he's he's definitely put his hand up for the wing. Uh, he's been kind of standing, he's scoring tries for fun. Yeah, he's, he's just a hell of an athlete. I think someone was saying he, he ran a 149 or 48 or something. Yeah, the 10 metres. Hell of a Puma athlete. Yeah, you know. and he's <laughs> you know, hashtag new levels and all yeah. that. Shit. Stay so, humble. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Plays a few games, scores a few tries. Yeah. Signs a Puma contract. Multi million pound <laughs> deal yeah. with Puma. With his brother. Yeah. John, sorry. <laughs> So, but now he's, he's another one that's explosive and just on the wing, just comes off his left foot and just glides by people. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you say, like Matty Williams, similar in that respect, both very, as soon as they get the ball, you're thinking, all right, well, I could be on here to get an offload once he breaks a line or something. Yeah, stem like shoulder. That. Everyone wants to, everyone knows that something's going to happen, yeah. um, which is, we've had in the past, obviously, well, last year, likes of Joe Cognacia and then Louis, it's the same yeah. sort of thing. You're, you're thinking, right, if you can get the, Ball and these guys with a one on one, then we'll back them all day long, sort of thing. Yeah. Speaking of Joe, it was nice to see him the other week. He was down after the Hartbury game. Yeah, he was, yeah. Uh, coming on to support you guys. Nice, yeah. to, um, nice to see him to get a chance to talk to him. Too. Uh, yeah, I spoke to him a little bit. All he could talk about was just seeing the debut. You know, Scoring yeah. tries, two yeah. games, two tries, no biggies. How much yeah. money is made playing for Yeah, so <laughs> many match fees and all that No, stuff. unfortunately, he was, yeah, was carrying a knock, so <coughs> there's nothing. Nothing major. Yeah. I just said he'll be fine for the Six Nations, mate. No, yeah, yeah, just yeah. get back for that. That's yeah. the main ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, but he was well. He was, he was in good form. It's good. To, uh, I have a lot of uh, contact with Joe, and it's it's great to see him doing so well. Because he is one of these guys who is genuinely a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. Like you can say, oh, even coming to, these, to our games and stuff, like, he's still got friends here, and he yeah, still wants yeah. to come along, support his friends, and the team that, that kind of gave him that break and um, spent that time with him. Yeah. It's great to see from him. He's actually, you know, by the way he plays, it's quite funny because he's, you know, he's so, you know, explosive and physical, and you know, he's got all the attributes. But as you say, take him off the pitch, just a quiet, nice guy. Um, he's got, you know, hasn't been affected by anything. Just, you know, goes on, goes about his business, and yeah, when you actually get to talk to him, you get a few words out of him eventually. Yeah. He's actually, yeah. he's actually a really nice guy. So, so it's, it's once again like when you when you know he's a nice guy, when you know he works really hard. It's really nice to see him like kick on. Doing so, well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, really... No, I totally agree. So, coming back to London Irish, obviously you guys, you both recently hit milestones for London Irish. Seb recently with 50 and Steely, you got your 100. Yep. It, when you get to a club, is that ever in the forefront where you're like, right, I want to hit this, I want to hit that? Or is it just suddenly you're like, someone comes up to you, taps you on the shoulder on the Friday and goes, it's your 100th game tomorrow. And you're like, is it? Um, well... For me, when I turned up, I was like, basically signed, um, and Brian Smith was here, and he sort of sold it to me like, you'll you'll get your chance in the LV Cup, and you'll get your your opportunities when we're playing the European stuff. So you know, like that's 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 a bit of game time there. In comparison to what I had done before at Leicester, that was like, well, at least I'm getting a chance here to show what I can do, sort of thing. And uh, that's the way he sort of sold it to me. I'd play, and if there's an injury or if I'd train well, I might sneak onto the bench now and again. So um, definitely in that respect, I was I wasn't expecting four four and a bit years down the line to, to be running out from a hundred. Um, so it was pretty pretty special in uh, terms of that. But um, but yeah, there's a bit of confusion with the what what actual game it was. You know, there was a few you know guys kicking around going like, oh, is it this week? And then you'd speak to. Um, a few guys in the office were like, no, it's this week, and the records are all going back and forth. And, yeah. but no, Do you know what I think that is? Sorry. I think, because we had the exact same thing with Topsy and Pacey, because yeah. they were punch for punch, uh, most appearances for, yeah. Yeah, for Irish at one stage. And what kept messing it up was the London Welsh game, because yeah. people that played in that game, <laughs> they were saying that that is an appearance, but now they're not... Then now because we didn't play them again, they're saying it wasn't appearance because the result was scrubbed. They actually came up. Um, that was said to us, and then I um, obviously spoke to Josh McNally about it because he's been at the other. He obviously was at Walsh. And I, and I said to him, I was like, oh, I don't think they're counting that Walsh game. He was like, there goes my thirty-five caps. <laughs> <laughs> so we're well, like for three years. It's nothing. Okay, cool, sweet. 
<laughs> you know, so yeah, there's always that little bit of little bit of confusion. My yeah, my fiftieth is actually my fifty first. Okay. So it's just one of those, but at the end of the day, um, so is that something that you consciously make note of, or are, would would you be like? I think when you get if you got an Excel spreadsheet at home, being like, <laughs> right. not quite, no. <laughs> <Some> <laughs> or is it like tips on a wall, like prison style? Some games I'd rather forget. So I'm probably <laughs> sitting there like, no, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. Um, I think when you get a little bit close, I think when you're within three or four games, uh, you know, you you keep an eye on it, but. Like you said, when you first arrive at the club, it's all just about you know making a great first impression, hopefully playing straight away, getting games on and stuff like that. And then if you start playing a lot, then you're like, actually, I could see myself, you know, getting fifty, getting to hundred, that type of stuff. Because it is, it is really something special to say, you know, one day maybe when we retire and have a couple of beers at the bar, it would be nice to say, oh yeah, I played hundred games in my life, I played fifty games or whatever it was, to just have a little bit of a a milestone, it's, it's always, it's always yeah. nice to hang your head on. So. I think in terms of counting games, I think at the end of the year you might look back and be like, oh, I've played this much. And that's quite good to sort of measure yourself and be, yeah. I got through this many games or I didn't get injured. Or if, if you did get injured, be like, oh, well, I actually missed out an opportunity to play maybe 10, 15 games. So, um, yeah, at the end of the season, I think you sort of look back and think, oh, well, yeah, I got through this amount of games and you sort of say, yeah, you wouldn't you maybe put a target on it. Some guys put a target on it, right? I want to play twenty games this year. Um, guys that struggle with injuries might say, yeah, I want to play fifteen, or I want to be available for twenty games. And if I get picked or not, I'm just happy that I'm fit because being injured and watching the boys play on the weekends is one of the most frustrating things. So, um, I think different people obviously approach it differently. You've got guys like David Pace and stuff who would just be like, oh, like wouldn't know at all. He'd just be getting on with it and. It's uh, another game and another challenge the next week, so I think it's an individual thing, but I wouldn't say anyone's going week to week being like, oh, this is my 49th, or well, yeah. well, maybe 49th, but they'll be <coughs> my 32nd game, I don't yeah. think they go like that and try yeah. and work it out, but, um, yeah. yeah, but to get you, to get 100 was, yeah, pretty special, and even the, even the 50 at that stage, I was ex- um, ecstatic to get to get to that amount of games, and short time that I managed to do it as well. Yeah, I mean you we've we've obviously got a wall down um towards the changing rooms into the gym. And it's uh it's not massively populated with people who've got hundred caps. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's quite it's quite thin air up there. Yeah. So which makes it a bit, a bit more special yeah, sort of thing absolutely. to see the, the sort of calibre of player as well that have played. There's there's a lot of internationals up there, um and boys that are that have done a lot for the club as well. So that that does make it special that um you know I get to walk into training See my ugly mug every day. It's a terrible <laughs> photo as well. The hairline's struggling. The hairline's but struggling. It's <laughs> thick, but the sentimental part's nice. That's, 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 that's. So, out of those 15 100, is there one specific game that stands out uh, for you guys? And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put one game out that you can't pick, and that's going to be the one at Twickenham because we've touched on that before. I made my debut at the other Twickenham game, though. Oh, did you? Game the double header. Yeah, so I oh, came from Irish. <laughs> Came from Irish and was on loan at Loughborough, played in front of like three men and the dog. <laughs> and then first game for Irish was like at Twickenham, like 60,000 people. I just remember my mum and dad came down to watch and I was like looking in the crowd, I was like, I don't think you're going to be able to spot them in this. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Stop yeah. looking at the crowd, get on with it. But um, if we're not going for Twickenham, then it's I think, I think your day is always special. Yeah. I think for a new club, it's, you know, it is always special. But for me, it would be. Because your, yeah. your debut was, uh, well, pre season, your first ever game. Oh, yeah. Which was the first. Yeah. Which was a win. It was the first time we beat them yes. at theirs in yeah. a long time. That was yeah. my first game as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. My first analysis game. Beautiful. <laughs> um, but I think for me, one of my favourite games was Yorkshire County, the last game of the Championship. Oh, that was hell to skeleton. It was a hell of a game looking back at <laughs> it. Again. But it was just, just the relief of we had done it. You know, there's there's so much pressure on us. There's so much different types of pressures. You know, on Not the pitch. mass pressure trying to work out. We got that <laughs> yeah. last game. How many are we yeah. actually ahead? Yeah. yeah, that was quite yeah. funny. Oh, That's yeah. something I've never. Oh, that was probably it was in the start of that game as well, where Hurley went in within like two minutes. Yeah, oh, that was amazing. It was just yeah. nice to actually arrive at that game and just be like, right, all we have to do is win. Yeah. We win. We, we, or not yeah, lose. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that, that, that doesn't go in the mind. Yeah, even that said, just win. Yeah. Win by one point, doesn't even matter, just win. Yeah. So it's nice because 
the four weeks leading up to that was like, okay, we're going away there. Okay, we beat them by X amount, so we go there with this much lead. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Then the first round was obviously like, oh, we got that much lead. So I was, it was a very odd situation, but just the, the relief of it all, just, you know, being able to, you know, finally sit in that chain with the trophy on the floor and just be like, we did it, we can just relax, you know? Was, uh, was something quite special. My, it's an odd one because we lost it, but when we played uh, Saris in New York, that was pretty special at the Red Bull Arena. Just the whole build up was there for a week. You get to go a lot of places in rugby, but America's not really one that you'd expect to go. Yeah. Um, just the, like, the way that training ramped up so much around the two weeks before it, just because it was like, Right, if I'm in the squad for this, this is unbelievable. What? Well, yeah. So, it was, so it was real, really good to 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 go there, and obviously we didn't get the result, but even the atmosphere there was amazing. The week before it, um, boys played well, scored some good tries, and we're lucky just to sort of let it slip towards the end. But um, I think my first Paddy's Day game at um, the Mad Stad was pretty special. There was about seventeen thousand people there. Um, we played Newcastle at home, and we won. Um, and I managed to score my first try as well for Irish as well. So yeah, I think that would be the 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 best one out there. Yeah, oh, nice, cool. So we we talked about it earlier. You guys were at Leicester together for two years. Were you there? I was there for three years. Just you were there at the same time for two years, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How was how was that? How was changing the culture at Leicester coming to Irish? Was it a big sort of culture shock? Because if you can't go Midlands to the big smoke. Yeah. Um, I think within the London Irish and this Thais environment, there's, yeah, big changes, big differences. I think um, she has more, you know, let the young boys express themselves, let them talk and stuff like that. And, you know, everyone's a lot nicer to each other. In the, in the how, you know, it's, I don't really know how to put it, but at least it's more, you know, you come and you do your work and you know people will either respect you or like you off of that rather than just you know coming in it's quite happy clappy type thing so i heard that where the academy are kind of you got to prove yourself before you kind of step up yeah it was, it was yeah, still it's, no more, yeah, it's, more of that than me i think a lot of things that they do are very helpful in terms of preparing you for professional rugby because it's not easy um you meet a lot of different personalities and not you won't get on with everyone but um and at the end of the day, it's, it's quite brutal. But um, there are certain things that you think, oh, I think that's maybe a step too far, just the way the tra- like training was uh, very much. You were there to facilitate the first team. And a lot of, lot of guys were just, you're basically cannon fodder. You're just you're getting smashed. If, if we'd be watching the game at the weekend and if like Leicester got beat badly and they sort of got beat up, we're all sitting there going, this is going to make next week absolute hell for us because ah. we're the ones that are going to get all the pain out of yeah, it. And, yeah. But on the other side of things, I think it toughens you up quite a lot in terms of um, making sure you're available for training, like physio and stuff like that. I think these days, looking at sort of the younger generation coming up, seem a bit more high maintenance compared to what um, it used to be like when I was certainly in the academy a lot of it, it goes both ways. You can get people going all toughen up when someone's actually injured. Yeah. And then you get the other side. If someone's, they might not be feeling a hundred percent, but when are you ever? Yeah, I was about pitch? to say. There's a lot of players um, that just bar up and get on with it and don't. I think people are scared of not playing well, and then they'll sort of link it to the injury, like the niggle that they've got. Yeah. And that will be in their head before they've even stepped on the pitch. Yeah. A lot of guys will go in being like, "Oh, like my shoulder's not feeling great. I will be able to get through it." But if something goes wrong in the first 10 minutes... It's not my fault, it's yeah, my shoulder. You can see kind them, of a cop, not a cop out, but like a... I would say so, because it's not particularly... It's not the shoulder's fault, but they're, they're just letting that be a reason for them to maybe um, have an excuse for, for a game that's not going well. Like Not everyone can play well all the time, and it's just one of them things. But I do think um, sort of seeing younger guys coming through and they go like maybe play a couple of games, get a niggle, and then they don't train the whole week and they don't play, and it's like... We used to, and Seb would be the same. If you got a chance to play, you would like strap up and just get on with it. Be like, because you won't get a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And, you and if you don't take them, then you, you're not you're not going to like get the next senior contract. You're not going to get it. So I think that mindset has made a bit of a shift. Um, 
I think that's just the way it's because it's got more professional in terms of the, the, the medical staff and, and whatnot. But um, I think it did uh, did me a lot of good actually being at Leicester, um, bar playing rug, actual game time because I didn't get a, a lot yeah. of that. <laughs> Played in a lot of alien games and stuff and learnt a lot of the players that were there. Obviously, like Ben Youngs um, and Sammy Harrison were, were there when I was there. Mickey Youngs as well, like good scrum halves and very good guys as well to speak to. Um, but it was just it was just a shame that I didn't play as much, and that was something that I was a bit um, frustrated with, and ultimately why that I moved on from there. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, um, you know, very similar to what Steve said. I was lucky enough to also be around very good players, and <clears throat> you learn a lot. And you know, some of the some of the experiences playing in front of twenty five thousand every second week at home is is something really. And you speak to a lot of guys on other teams, one of like you know, one of their favourite grounds is Welford Road because it's just you know it's got that history and all of that, but it's also just a really nice, really nice stadium. Change rooms are absolute shy, but yeah. um, the actual stadium. It's surprising how many are that bad in the Prem. Bath, yeah. horrible. Bath is terrible, yeah, uh, yeah nice. Leicester's is Harlequins, Quins, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I really, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, some there's some really good people there, you know, in terms of backroom staff and stuff but also the players good group of good group of boys and stuff and made some really good mates but like Steely says sometimes you know it's some some players are happy to be at a club and be be a Leicester Tigers player but they actually aren't playing yeah they, you know they are at Leicester Tigers one of the most successful clubs in Europe X, Y and Z you know um, but I think Steely is quite similar to me in that way that the reason why we play rugby is to actually play rugby so yeah. you know um when you're there and you know people are like oh this is going really well oh, you, you know you're playing in the quarterfinals of Europe you're going away and you you know you're pushing Claremont at Claremont type thing and you get the very rare opportunity that you are involved in those games and I, I was lucky enough to be involved in some of them but the majority of them you know you, you, towards the towards my like end of my third year didn't really play much and you know the highs and the lows you don't really you're not really in it, you know, no, so you're not part of it. So, yeah, yeah you're a less Tigers player, and that's awesome. But do, do you playing, feel a bit cheap if there's that point where they win a cup, like like the Premiership or something like that, and then you're kind of, you're there? I don't think you should feel bad because it's that iron sharpens iron, I think. Yeah. And I think the people who are those guys that are at a club and are the training bodies uh, and maybe only get a shot now and again are just as important as the guys that are playing week in week out because you wouldn't have one without the other yeah yeah, for sure I think yeah it is just yeah as you say you can't have the one without the other but it has got that little bit of extra you know amazing feeling knowing that okay even if you don't actually play in, in the final let's say but you 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 played your 15 20 games that season you really helped you know you, you you were played in some of the tight games, you played in some of the losing games, but you played in some of the big wins. Yeah. Those, that's the feeling where you can actually sit and be like, yeah, I, I won a premiership. You know, I think, I don't think you'll hear many, well, you know, I speak for myself here, but I wouldn't really say if I hadn't played a game or I'd only played one or two games and we won the premiership, I wouldn't say, I would be like, oh yeah, I've won a premiership. You know, I would, yeah. I would be more like, oh yeah, when I was there, Irish won the premiership type thing. It's just, yeah. that's something personal though. Yeah. Um, but for me, example, I played like thirty seconds in a semi final on an LV Cup against Bath or Leicester because they had like a plague or something at nine, and everyone was there all the I was just the last one left. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Coach was like, "You're in." I don't even know your name, but you're in. <laughs> so I was on the bench, and then we won that game. Um, it's funny, Skips was actually in the same team. He was like captain of that team, I think, and then went on the next week to play Northampton in the final, sat on the bench, didn't go on 80 minutes, and then after it, everyone's like, everyone's played most of the games and that, and it was it was a bit, it was it was a weird feeling, obviously. Yeah. I was sitting there and I was in the academy, I wasn't even in like training full on with the first team properly, and it was just a bit like, it is good, but it's not, I'm not like, it's not yours, like yeah. and then there was also on the flip side, it was like Alex Linton had played every single game up until then, and then got dropped for, I think it was Scott Hamilton, someone with a bit more experience for the final. Ooh, and it's brutal. just really, hard, like, really harsh. And he's just like, he's done a lot more work. And yeah. he doesn't get that bit. And I'm the opposite where I've done nothing. And then I turned up and I sat on the bench and went, oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Like, yeah. But as Seb said, I don't, I don't feel like I've, I've not obviously done anything to win that. I've just probably 
right place at the right time and managed to sit on the bench. Yeah. And <laughs> <know what else. laughs> the worst thing about that is when I came on against Bath, it was like they like were chasing the game, chipped it over the top, and all I had to do was catch it and put it out. And I passed it. Uh, I went to pass it to someone, sort of like panicked, took it in. Got turned over and they nearly went the length and stuff. <laughs> it's not no. only they're only put thirty seconds. I nearly lost it. The coach was probably going, "Oh, should I put on?" That? <laughs> that, what's his name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't put him on the bench. Yeah. <laughs> right. So coming back to uh, London Irish, both you guys, you are part of the social committee here. Well, you are. You are the social. We are. We are, are the social. The social committee. committee. We are. The Obviously, social. today a big day. So Christmas dinner. Yeah. Uh, what have you guys got planned? Oh, just another Monday, really. Just you know, another day that have a little dinner, one. have a couple of drinks, bed by six, nice. you know, get up, chill in the morning. It's professional that. rugby, isn't yeah. it? It's how it is. You know, body is simple and all that, so <laughs> yeah, I'll be having the lean turkey this afternoon. Yeah. No sides. Just, no pigs in blanket. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be following the rugby grub. Yeah, yeah. so sort yeah, at rugby grub, give them all a plug there. But <laughs> yeah, no, so we've got the Christmas... Lunch today, which we've been having, we've, we've been doing it for the last little how long? Yeah, we do. Yeah, kind of an institution here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah all good. the staff comes together, all the boys, and it's just it's a really nice afternoon. Um, well, luckily, this year though, it's formal week where we do obviously don't have a game next yes. week. So usually we are there, um, all the staff are there, but we've got um, a game at the weekend, so no one's allowed to drink as, in terms of the playing squad, and then the staff just get absolutely annihilated in front of us and we just watch going great this is this is really good fun so um, oh, some of the stuff yeah, no, <laughs> some of the stuff um, but yeah so this year we're obviously no games so we've got tomorrow off so we can have a few a few lemonades um, we're yep. doing a bit of a secret Santa beforehand yeah um, oh well we're in the same in yeah. the same one as well yeah uh, um, so and then um, yeah just a few chilled festivities afterwards so it's going to be a good day Good to see the sun for once. Yes, for once yeah, today, especially so. the last few days. That's always, that's there were some good. times in uh, Pirates where I generally didn't know if it was raining or if it was just a spray off the ocean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was 50 Either 50. way, it wasn't nice. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, so, as social committee, uh, what is it? Do you have like monthly socials? How do you kind of, and is it all getting together? Or is it like a Christmas one, a summer it's, one? Yeah, we try to have like a couple. As many as we can. But yeah. I think the coaches have the final say on when, when's a good opportunity to do it. Obviously, you have to pick and choose. You can't be doing it like we've had a few years when we've had tried to have a Christmas social, but we've had really important games either side or, or Worcester last yeah, year. That yeah. one, yeah. So like that sort of got pushed, um, which was obviously all the players understood as well. And um, so it's picking the right time. We go to the coaches and. Um, say to them, we're thinking this day, what are you thinking? They might say, oh, no, this one, and they'll be like, yeah, fine. So then we try and organise something around that. Um, we try and get as much money out of the club as possible to pay for the majority of what we're going to do, which <laughs> is was, probably the hardest yeah. part of the job. Um, yeah, have, so, to, have to butter up. Yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah. You know? yeah. So I thought I'd just give them a bacon sandwich and you'd party. We tried that. Yeah. It didn't yeah. work. Yeah. So, um, you just ate it and gave us nothing. Yeah. yeah. So we do that, and then also we've got a players fund that we put into, um, that we directly pay into every month that like sort of goes towards this. But um, is that the uh, haircuts as well? Does that go into uh, it? That's yeah, that's, that's a different fund through Blair with the haircuts. Yeah, yeah, another plug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was a rough gents barber <laughs> for you. Who did Check him on Instagram. Yeah, so that also, but I think he's more going to do that. It's just going to go to the end of year social. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, which is obviously yeah. usually the biggest one because you've got. Five weeks or so after for your holiday, so that's 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 the one that's we're we're under pressure to do it, perform and make sure everything goes to plan. But I think the end of year one's the the big one. So yeah. obviously for boys that will move on, um, it's a big one for them. They want to have one last drink with the boys before they go separate ways, etc. Guys retiring, for example, and um, so that's the one that's the one you look forward to the most. But this would probably be the second in the list. It's just a dry run, yeah. Yeah. So, is it always are the socials always uh, drinking affair or they're like maybe go paintballing or go karting or you just get around to have dinner and a coffee or yeah so a bit of that a bit of you know we try to organise just just a meal just get together it's more about just actually just spending time together outside of the training ground because I mean obviously you know we we see each other every day and all that type of stuff and it's all quite intense as well whenever you do yeah, see it's, each other it's quite full on and stuff so it's nice just to actually go and you know, switch off for the night, you know, 
have a burger and chips. Well, obviously, I wouldn't have burger and chips. Obviously, turkey breast, <laughs> yeah. brown rice type stuff. But Two burgers and chips. <laughs> <laughs> but we also do like quite good ones where we get um, partners and wives and children. We have obviously more of a meal and sit down and you get to meet everyone that way. And that, yeah. That's good. That's Because obviously, you spend so much time with your teammates every day, but you might know nothing about the, the wife or the him, like the children or stuff like that. So that's good to get everyone involved. And when you turn up to games, you see these faces and you can actually put a name to them rather than just being like, oh, you're right. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. So the boys get brownie points. Yeah. The wives and girlfriends. Absolutely, so yeah. We, we get put on I'm taking you out for a meal. Where are we going? Yeah. Uh, the club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, get, we get a lot of pressure from guys that have got, you know, a bit under the thumb. When's, when's the next, like, partners and stuff social and we'll be like yeah yeah that's coming up totally how do you guys do that because obviously you go single yeah oh yeah our girlfriends are away a lot so yeah you know, we actually do have much. girlfriends but yeah. they, they're on the modern gigs usually oh yeah. Milan New yeah. York time uh, I hear you I'm yeah. the same they, yeah. they, they <laughs> let, like, let us get on with our job yeah. so it's only right we used to be really lucky like our them. girlfriends are our best friends yeah okay. so they're always together they haven't actually met anyone else yeah okay but they do exist. They don't, yeah. have, don't have Instagram or yeah. Facebook anything. Just, just don't like photos people. because obviously that's their job. So yeah. we yeah. take photos of them. It's kind of just, you know, yeah. models. And, yeah. But they, you know, we obviously crack the whip in the relationship as well. <laughs> yeah. So we just do what we want and they just got to get along with it. But no. There are, some, standard, there are some boys, you know, who are a bit under... Th- I won't mention names, obviously, you know. They, <laughs> they, you know, crack the whip and stuff. So they have to get brownie points before yeah. they're allowed out. So... But um, no, it's, it's, as Steve says, it's more for everyone to get to know each other. You know, it's, it's especially for, there's not actually a lot of people who are from London. You know, there's a lot of people all over from all over England and also all over the world. Yeah. And it is nice to be able to, you know, take your girlfriend, take your wife, kids and everything to the games and not have to be with them the whole time. They've actually got their own friends within the yeah. club. And, What's got to um, be the thing, that I, I say professional uh, rugby players as well as any professional athlete this in a team sport every year well when your contract's up you could be somewhere else so yeah. the first people that your partners are going to meet are the partners of other yeah. players it is it is so funny I think how you know the rugby world how like it changes your whole mindset I think in terms of you know you literally are see each other every single day you literally are, see each other more than more than your family and then, yeah, within literally a little signing off a piece of paper, you could most probably never see that person ever again. Yeah. It's, and it's kind of that strange, but it also works in the roundabouts. I, mean, I remember... Some of them you're quite glad not to see. <laughs> yeah. It works that way as well. But I mean, um, well, yeah. It's, you know, Terence is a good example. When we when, yeah. when he went back to New Zealand, I mean, I thought of it, I was like, shit, we've actually got really close and stuff. And now there's a high chance. I'll, you know, we'll stay in contact, but actually, you know, go for a beer or go for a meal. Like, that's much probably not going to happen. I mean, New Zealand's also miles away, and no one wants to go to New Zealand. Like, who wants to go there? Same <laughs> as Scotland. So, but I mean, um, and then, you know, I end up at London Irish, and two or three years down the line, here he, he rocks up, you know. So yeah. it, is, it is quite strange. The rugby world is, is quite small. And, yeah. But you always hear players very, saying very meticulous things in interviews because if they upset someone, Nine times out of ten, they're going to be coming around the corner again yeah, at some definitely. point. It does work like that. And then also, unfortunately, in this day and age, the way that it works, like head coaches and stuff are getting, it's getting a bit like football in terms of one minute they're there, next minute they're somewhere else. And if you've bumped the bridge there, it's not that club, but maybe that individual director of rugby, he moves somewhere else and you had an opportunity to yeah. go and then he pulls the plug because of something you've said or done or acted. So... Is even more important now with the movement of what's going on. If teams aren't going particularly well, and it's, it's good to good to yeah, not not burn bridges that way. Nice. So we'll go on to uh, last bit before we get onto our fans' questions. Uh, what is it that you guys get up to into your spare time? I know, Seb, you were big into uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, don't even know how much time do we have. <laughs> no, um... I remember last, not last year, the year before. Every Tuesday, we'd set up a projector into the team room, yeah. and we'd almost have a little mini cinema and watch the latest yeah. episode. Always bring a few treats. Yeah, yeah. The next Max, watch we'll get together. Max North, yeah, Max North got green. 
let them let the team down a couple of times because you know those episodes got leaked. Yeah. And you know we all decided, nah, we won't watch them. We we'll yeah. watch them all together. We'll stay strong and together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he's like, he's like when you with your partner, green, you sat down. Not. Yeah. To have a, you know, you you've got a Netflix series yeah. with your partner. You sat down. Oh, I won't cheat. I won't go and yeah. watch another one. He's the worst part was he'd just come and like whisper stuff in your ear in the gym of like the episode he's he's already watched. So yeah, he's out of the night's watch. He's <laughs> north of the wall fending with the wild things, so that's all right. But um, no, it's spare time. I'm actually studying at the minute. So, oh, nice. What are uh, you studying? Uh, business and sports management. Okay. So I just do that. Um, meet the boys for some coffees. You know, just kind of take it easy, really. You know, training can get hard at times. So wake up on an off day and just meet the boys for some food and you know, sitting in a coffee shop and just chilling out is kind of, kind of nice. And then obviously... Some days I'm just, you know, doing uni work all day. So yeah, not not too much to be honest. But uh, but uh, that's um, still pretty similar. I'm actually recently, um, I've still not got my driving's license, and I'm 25 years old, which I know is <laughs> embarrassing, and I do get a lot of stick for it. But yeah, um, that's a skill that I'm trying to. You know, Why drive when you can be driven? Yeah, you very true. I mean? But there is a lot of times I've just fed up with <laughs> it now that I'm just stuck somewhere or you know waiting texting someone being what time are you going in to training tomorrow and waiting for a reply and all sorts that I was just like I've got to do it so I've actually I did a test maybe two weeks ago and I failed it I cut someone off on a roundabout oh. but I've, apart from that I was all good <laughs> which um, yeah so I've got that coming up again uh, so that's something that I'm doing in my spare time at the minute um, which is quite expensive I keep failing uh, it's, cra- it's crazy expensive. Yeah, it's, it's crazy expensive. So I'm happy to get that out of the way and done. But no, very, very similar to said in terms of uh, socialising with the boys on the day off. Um, he's a pretty decent golfer. He's quite a good golfer. Yeah, yeah, I, heard, I heard, I heard, I um, heard. Uh, Josh McNally was actually slating your golf. That is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> he is one of the, well, actually. The, he retired officially from golf the other day because he was that bad when we played. <laughs> uh, he, said, he said he's got a family now, he's got to settle down. Oh, that's can't. the excuse he's used, but he's terrible. I've seen him play after a couple of beers as well. It gets yeah. worse. So, really? Yeah. So, no, I don't know got, if he should be throwing up comments like that. We've got quite, quite a good golf crew that we play. Um, obviously, it's getting a bit colder now, so we won't do that um, until it gets a bit warmer. But no, a good bunch of boys, myself, uh, Blair Cohen, uh, Brent McKibben, Greg Tonks, Mike Coleman, a few guys like Mike Coleman and Tommy Bell that have sort of came into it and sort of won that team before. Well, not that team, but haven't played that much and they're playing more and getting better. So, um, no, that's a good way to spend some time on a day off. And we're lucky enough through the club to get our, um, we get sort of free rounds up at Fox Hills, which is very kind of and it's very nice sort of place. Really to nice school. course. Yeah, it's like well. good after. So you go off, like play Thanks around. Fox Hills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so play there and then as you say it's real nice set up there so chill out have some food after chill out with the boys so no, um, no I do enjoy that we actually usually at the end of the year go on a, a golf trip away for um, we'll go for a few nights out and play a few rounds of golf so. do you Portugal or go abroad we, we or did, stay local sorry we went Portugal mid lovely. that was Mar- March yeah it was very year? lovely yeah it, very was, lovely. it was raining most of the time <laughs> over there, so that was terrible but End of year, two years now, we went to Marbella. Oh, nice. A few boys played there. And we're sort of going through the process of having a trip to Ireland where Conor Gilson is going to put us up for a few days and show us the, the spots around there and play a few rounds of golf. And we've got eight, eight lads there at the minute that are in on that trip, so that's going to be very good. Good job we can edit this. Yeah. Um, yeah, speaking of Ireland, uh, there's a golf course on the west coast where I grew up in a scrum. Right, it's um, Sand Dunes uh, Lynx course. Yeah, absolutely fantastic course if you ever get a chance. And it's got probably the best beach in Ireland. That's not, that's not saying much, though, is it? Whoa, I'm, I'm hold, on. Said, I'm hold on, hold on. I'm just thinking. <laughs> 
on the coast, west coast, it's going to be really windy and that's going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> maybe okay, it's, it's not that bad because it's behind, so the dunes are up. Oh, okay. So they're kind of a wind blocker. There's a yeah. few that like they're on top. Uh, if the wind's behind you, you can easily hit 500 yards. Um, <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> Whether it goes straight or not yeah, is totally different. Thing. Um, but yeah, that's a real good course. If you get yeah. a chance, to head out there. Um, yeah, that's the one that I, I grew up right next nice. to. It's a real nice course. A real nice beach and very, very good pubs as well. Yeah. There's a pub there, if you do go, called Hoskins, which is basically someone's front room. Interesting. Um, very, very old experience. school. Yeah. Very, very old school. Yeah. Very good Guinness. Very good food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Great. So, obviously, we said about it earlier. We you get we kind of get a good break in the summer, five to six weeks. Where do you guys uh, like to holiday? Where, where do you go away? Said so, just goes home straight away, which is pretty boring. Just go straight back to South Africa. Yeah, you know, family's fighting a good fight in Africa. You know, so <laughs> got to look after my pet line and nice. you know, nice. don't feed themselves. So. Gotta get home. And so you've got no marks on your hand. You haven't been trying to pet any lions. No, your, your no, lions no, yeah. quite tame. My yeah, my pet lions are very tame. Doesn't bite you. Yeah, yeah well, unless on, on command. <laughs> yeah, That's got you. With me, they're very chill. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, my sister's just had a little boy. So oh, nice. Yes, uncle. So, first uncle. Yeah, first, first little one of the. Yeah, she started walking the other day. So mm-hmm. very exciting time. So instead of spending my four or five days drinking beer with Scott, I'd much rather just go and see him. So nice. she can't keep up, can you? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, got, I get home pretty soon, but yeah, that's pretty much me, just go see family and friends, really. Um, yeah, I usually, there'll be a group of us here that'll go away together, um, just for three or four days, pretty much. As soon as we finish, do that, and then I'll just head back um, to Scotland, um, catch up with friends and family there, um, and then maybe go away. So last year I went away to Barcelona as well with a friend from back home just oh, for nice. a few days, which was real chilled out and, and decent. Yeah, but um, just mainly spend time with family back there. Um, don't they don't get down as much as they'd like, sort of thing. So it's good just to when I'm back, just to actually just chill out with them. And uh, I used to go to school in Edinburgh for a while, so I've got quite a lot of friends based up there. So it's good to incredible city. Out. We went there last year, first time I ever went there. Wow. Yeah, true absolutely nice. stunning city, and it was right around Christmas for us. All the Christmas fairs were out. It was out. freezing, wasn't it? It was very cold, and we won't talk about the plane journey on the way home. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the game for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's just to raise that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. We are into our fans' questions now. Uh, thank you, everyone, who's uh, sent in any questions that you have. We will uh, get through them all. Uh, our first one is from James O'Reilly uh, on Twitter. Uh, his Twitter handle is at jr underscore O'Reilly. Uh, he would like to know, uh, what sport would you be playing if you weren't a rugby player? I would be playing football. So I played football um, all the way through school. Sort of like play football uh, on the Sunday and play rugby on the Saturday sort of thing. And then got to an age where I had to make a decision and decided to go rugby. Um, but no, I still, still enjoy watching football and playing football. Uh, Who's your teams? Uh, so I would say I am a Celtic fan, but I sort of dropped off um, in my support for them, which is London's changed. Just, yeah, just ah, the way it is. Chelsea we, fan now. Um, well, we get free tickets <laughs> for the clubs for a few Chelsea games, which is really cool, um, and the seats are unbelievable. So yeah, Mick Crossing sorts them out for a few lads every now and again, which is. Uh, really good so yeah go, go to a few of them games but, to be um, fair I, big fan. I've been to I went to a few games last year um, I'm a big Liverpool fan obviously had a great day yesterday yeah. uh, if anyone didn't know they beat Manchester United 3-1 uh, <laughs> yeah. Manchester United were lucky to get one um, but yeah I, I've been to uh, Sanford Bridge a few times uh, one of them was a Champions League game oh, yeah. unbelievable absolutely yeah. incredible stadium I think like the way that like where the seats are and everything like that. Like you could go to like any game and it's just you're so close to the players and you sort of get a new appreciation of how fast and how quick everything oh, yeah. is and they, they are like tiny but they are unbelievably explosive and everything and it's just yeah. incredible to see that they are proper athletes, you know what I mean? When you watch it on T V just everyone's like on the same like playing field and it's just like oh it's just it's just the way it is. It's just football, they're all quite yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually when you're right there the first and the challenges as well. Yeah, like, no, you look at it on TV, you're like, oh, that was nothing. But when you're actually there, there is a bit of a yeah. clatter, and yeah. you're like, oh, not for sure. Because the seats that uh, Mick Crossland does sort us out are 
I think they're probably what 10, 15 rows back in yeah. centre centre circle. Yeah, halfway, it is absolutely the best seats. Yeah. Um, what about you, Seb? Any sports uh, lion tamer aside? Yeah. To be honest, um, growing up, I've just played played everything, loved everything. Um, had an older brother who was also very sporty, and uh, older sister as well. She was also very sporty, so just generally played everything. But if I had to put it down to something, before I got serious into rugby, I was it's quite it's big into my cricket. Also okay. my football as well, so it was probably that, but getting older, I don't think, I'm not sure I just watch sport now. Steely's actually seen my golf as well, and that really does yeah, quite good it's, it's my career. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, pretty much. Actually, pretty just, much yeah, just got, got a bit of a dart script at the club. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah the new dart balls come in, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and so. table tennis. Yeah. Uh, table tennis is dart. Is that died darts, off? Darts There's a few around. guys that still play, but... Yeah. Darts has taken over now. Yeah, so I've had a couple of games against off. Pat. Pat's quite good at uh, table tennis. Yeah, he's terrible at darts. I think, so. I think terrible at darts. Tom Foley is the best table tennis player. Is he? It used to be Ben Ransom, which absolutely kills me because he's <laughs> just a bit, you know, arrogant and everything that he does. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. He was just unbelievable. He's good at golf as well. <laughs> he's not bad at rugby. So. <laughs> yeah. oh, he's one of those. Stop talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> terrible bloke. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. Uh, <laughs> Right, uh, next question is from Megan Wade on Twitter. Uh, handle is at Megan underscore Wade XX. Uh, who is the best player you've played alongside? Scott Steele. <laughs> that easy. <laughs> uh, I think played and trained with a different thing. <laughs> when I was at Leicester, there was a few good players, but, you know, I was just passing them balls in the water. Uh, Played with. That's a tough question. Hey, it's not me, it's Megan, it's her. Megan, tough question. Um, just a few. Think back and, you know, I'll give him a, I'll give him a good plug because he's a good mate, but Miles Benjamin in, was one of my favourite players to play with just because he was an absolute freak of nature in terms of an athlete and the, the player he was but also he was a very good friend so it almost adds a little bit to you know playing yeah. with him and stuff it's like obviously still he's a good player but terrible bloke so yeah. you know it takes a little bit away from it but can't have it all <laughs> <laughs> no I'd say yeah Miles Benjamin would be up there but I mean you know the easy answers are the Manitou Luggy Ben Youngs and you know those yeah. type of players but I think which obviously was special but I really enjoyed you know playing with Guys that are obviously good players, but also could, you know, go for a couple of beers afterwards and actually have a laugh, you know, and stuff like that. So, Miles Benjamin, I enjoyed enjoyed playing with Jeff Parlin. Um, but there's, yeah, so much think now. Just, it's too many names to think about. My my answers would be more, maybe not at the time they were the best, but now they're, okay. they've improved and they're they're up there. Would be um, Finn Russell and. Uh, yeah, Finn Russell definitely. Was that at school? Uh, no, that was at under twenties level. So he was um, a year above me, and we played together in the same twenties age group. And back then, he was he was good, but he just sort of had this feeling that he, he wasn't he wasn't really he probably confessed himself that dedicated to rugby in that terms. He, he wasn't thinking I want to be a professional rugby player, and I think you can sort of tell that in the way that he plays. That he's very very relaxed in everything he does. But just watch watch the game that he played. Um, against Leicester the other day and he had some like very nice touches so he'd be one of them and then uh, another one sort of similar to Sebs and all round sort of broke arm player would be uh, Thomas Waldron uh, at Leicester oh, yeah. um, played a lot of games with him uh, I, I think he is probably one of the most underrated players yeah, that's, that's also, yeah. he's he's just a one unbelievable best, one of the best player, guys so. you'll meet in the game as well so fit didn't look probably <laughs> no, like a great athlete yeah <laughs> But he was he, he could run for days. Cake with his tea. Yeah, could run for days. Uh, knows the game inside and out. Knows where the trial line is, obviously. Ultimate and, poacher yeah. around the rucks. Uh, he's he's just Looks a real good guy. Incredibly as well. powerful as well. Mm. Yeah, strong. He's quite squat, sort of. Yeah. But yeah, he's he's a real good guy as well. So um, yeah, I'll probably he's back in Canterbury now. Yeah, right? he's yeah. Went, he went headed back out there. Yeah, he's, he's playing my ten. Yeah, I think he's officially retired now. Oh, is he? Yeah, I'm not too sure actually, but yeah, back in NZ. Uh, so this one is from the London Irish fans. 
uh, which is at London Irish Fans, coincidentally. Uh, what are you hoping you to get this Christmas? Girlfriend would be nice. Another one. <laughs> no chance of that. You're <laughs> <laughs> barking up the wrong um, tree, mate. Yeah. What would I want for Christmas? Um, I've already got my Christmas present, which was a bit oh. less exciting. Well, my family are up in Scotland, so I basically just buy their presents and send them to my mum's house. Same. And she wraps them all up and does that. So in return, my uh, family got me a nice, cosy, north face jacket. Oh, nice. Is, yeah, very nice. So, um, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Well, to be fair, my mom and my brother are over at the minute, so. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so when you live far away from home, kind of just people visiting is kind of a nice gift. Yeah. So, my brother goes back um, in a couple of days' time, but my mom's staying for Christmas, so that's almost a nice gift. So, yeah. To be fair, my uh, I'm going to my mum's this Christmas, and uh, I keep asking her what she wants, and she's like, "Oh, just you coming home is good enough." And I'm yeah. like, "I guarantee Christmas morning, if it's just me, you're going to be like, the eyes will be closed, arms out, yeah, like, where's, gifts? where's my gifts?" Yeah. It's like, no, yeah. <laughs> it's right here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's what you said you wanted. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's go on to our next one, which is our Facebook, and it's Gregor Galloway. Uh, what's it like playing for London Irish? We've kind of touched on it earlier. Um, it's just, it's a really nice family club, um, really nice group of boys. You actually, for me personally, do feel like you're playing with your mates and you're going out there and you actually want to play for each other and stuff. So it is a very special, special club. Yeah, and I've enjoyed every second of it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty similar. Um, no, it does, it's a special place for me and give me my opportunity in professional group properly. So... Um, yeah, it means a lot to me. Um, over the last couple of years, obviously in the Premiership, it's been extremely frustrating at times. Um, so yeah, but uh, I think that's the case because everyone's just pushing so hard to try and you know uh, improve and get better and get the club in a better place than it is at the minute. So um, it's quite frustrating when everyone's trying to do that and it's not working out. But um, you know, I'm turning up to work every day. Um, it's a happy place to be at, and yeah, I can't complain. Yeah, I'd have to say that as well. I think last year wasn't great. Yeah. Um, but you could never tell that on the pitch, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the training field. I think everyone still came in, uh, obviously yeah. upset, but um, wanted to do better. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it was always a good atmosphere. So. Um, we have another one from uh, Queef, who's our match announcer. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't a rugby player, uh, what sport would you secretly think you were brilliant at? Now, obviously, we've done that. Uh, before um, what would you be if you weren't a rugby player but this is more of what would you want to be so yeah. say like basketball or something like that I was going to say that I think I would be yeah. NBA MVP most, <laughs> just straight most, straight most in there MVP running. yeah okay running. I think that would be something okay yeah. no nah, um, yeah I'd actually I'd, 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 I'm I like watching NBA and NFL and stuff, and I just love how different it is to what we used to. So, yeah, something on those lines was probably. Okay. If, if I was really good at the sport, that's that's the way I'm going to answer it. I would say because I just like watching it. Um, something like boxing would be a good sport. You'd get battered, mate. But if I was very good at it, <laughs> <I wouldn't laughs> yeah, you wouldn't get battered. This is the point of the question. <laughs> was, um, yeah, I, I think that's good. I think the whole way that it's. Like it's a show and it's built up and there's so much hype before fights and then it all comes down to two guys going at it. I think that's pretty cool and would be a pretty exciting sport to be involved in. Yeah, I, so are you a big boxing fan yourself? Or? I am more so now, not not so much in the past, but no, when there's fights going on now, I like to I, I like the, the whole build up to it um, and then watching the fight itself, yeah. Did you watch one on the um, weekend? Geez. Canelo, Alvarez. No, 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 Knocked a guy out in the third round. Yeah. Yeah. Highest paid, he just signed a £350 million deal. Uh, yeah. So that would yeah, be my option. Bob. Yeah, <laughs> that would definitely be my option now, um, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Okay. Um, right, David Carter, uh, also on Facebook. Do you, both, uh, do you both think teams in the Championship are more competitive this season since the last time we were down? I think it's changed in terms of obviously certain teams have improved and then other teams have sort of dropped off because we obviously were in a final against um, Carnegie. Yorkshire, yeah, Carnegie, and they, they seem to have 
uh, lost a few players, um, fortunately for them, and struggling. Teams, yeah, struggling, struggling yeah. better, and yeah. then other teams have got better, like the likes of Ealing and stuff like that. So I think it has changed, but I think overall every team, as you can see from the results, have got a chance of beating each other this year, which makes it interesting. So. Overall, I think the, the squads and the teams have, have got better um, since the last time. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I think it's stepped up massively. Yeah. Um, I think there's still quite a big gap between the Prem and the, and the Championship, but the Championship is definitely getting more and more competitive each, each year. So, yeah. Okay. So, that gives us a good segue into our last question. This is one that I wanted to ask last because it is, uh, I think it's on the forefront of a lot of our minds, especially at the minute in rugby. Um, what are your thoughts on the ring fencing of the Premiership? Obviously, it has a big effect on us uh, as a team, potentially. Uh, hopefully not. Um, but what what's your kind of thoughts on it? I think, I think it could work. Um... In terms of if you do it for a set period, maybe two or three years or something, and then you, you know, get some funding into the championship where you know every, like maybe top six, you know, sixth place get a certain amount of money, fifth gets a little bit more, fourth, third, and then um, you can look at it as if you were uh, an Ealing or something like that. Let's say best case scenario, we go up and Ealing stay down, and let's say they ring fence it for the next three years a team like Ealing could be like, okay, so cool, that's obviously not what we want, but the next three years we're going to win the championship and get, by the end of three years we'll have X amount of money so we can buy two or three or four world-class players or we can put that towards our stadium or, you know, certain things like that. And that's that's how I would do it. But I think it's 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 obviously not as simple as that. But I think if you get some financial incentive into the championship, then even your lower teams, your your Richmonds, your Harperies, instead of them just you know struggling week in and week out, season in season out, they could be like, well, we're actually going to go for, we finished 10th last season, we're actually going to go for 8th this season because that means we'll get an extra £50,000 or £20,000, whatever it is, and that's a new stand at the stadium or that's, two or three extra players or something like that. So yeah. I think it could work, but I think there's a lot of... you got to sift through the mud first, I think, before it actually ever comes out with an actual solution. So um, Obviously, for us, if we were to be involved in the, in the Premiership and it was ring fence, it would it'd be good for us in terms of it takes a little bit of pressure off. You know, you can lose your first couple of... or your first block of games in the Premiership and then all of a sudden it's just relegations on your mind every game you play in the media it's all there and it's it would be better to sort of play with a bit um, more freedom you'd, you'd be going into games looking to attack teams rather than playing not to lose um, which is good for viewing um, yeah you want to see running rugby rather than teams just kicking it kicking it and then trying not to not to concede basically um, and also on the same side as that, I think it would help in terms of bringing through younger talent, because you you know there's not as much on the line as to say in terms of if we lose a game and yeah. you could get English players coming up through and they would get more of a chance. Say if it's getting towards the end of the season, you're not really pushing for you know six top six or top four, then are your guys are un under pressure to you know, play the strongest team even though nothing's on the line sort of thing. So that'd be good. But on the flip side, I sort of agree with Seb that there's, there's got to be something set up for the championship because if they do, if they do ring fence, it is, it's just sort of, what's, it's, a, it's not a nothing league, but it's what is the end goal of these teams? And Which is quite funny because there are teams in the championship that don't want to get promoted. Like Absolutely. They, they just want to stay where they are, which is fine for them. And obviously they've got the reasons for doing that, but you know, your, the likes of Ealing and your other teams that do want to get promoted. Pirates as well. I mean, Pirates. they've got big investment coming yeah. in. They're, I think they're moving to a new ground yeah. soon as well. Yeah. So teams like that, it sort of leaves them going, well, investors wouldn't be as likely to invest if that end goal isn't there. Yeah. You wouldn't get the stories of Exeter coming through and doing what they've done, which has been amazing. So both sides have got their arguments. But as I said, if you could get a, a system where you get rewarded for winning the championship in a way that could towards you Finan yeah, and financially I think yeah. I, I, I think as well I'm, I'm, we, I mean we talk about it quite a bit as well it, 
the ring fencing of the Premiership as well, how do you do it? Like, who do you go into 13 teams? Yeah. Or do you keep it down as 12? Do you do what the Pro, like the pro 14 have done? Exactly. Like two different conferences almost. Well, my, uh, I always thought that at the moment everything's play welfare, right? It's all about play welfare, play welfare, play welfare. Yet, there's more games now than there's ever been. Yeah. They're increasing the A League. They're you got the Premiership Shield. Um, you've still got European rugby, and you've got the Premiership. So there's more rugby being played than there ever has. I think if you have thirteen teams, you get bye weeks. That gives you players rest weeks. And I think perhaps you look at the Premiership Premiership Shield and the A League, and perhaps you have a kind of FA Cup sort of style between. Those academy, senior academy, academy playing sides in the Premiership, and those first team sides in yeah. uh, the Championship, well, and you have and you, you have that cut process. Yeah. Then you're building these teams. They have that exposure, yeah. but I think we need to look at it in the side of that the Championship is its own entity, and you've got to think every single team there has coaches, yeah. backroom staff. They all want to fight towards to be in top flight sure. cutting that off a lot of people could unfortunately be in a bad financial situation yeah. so I think that fi- financially I think if play- if premiership players look at championship teams and championship players and perhaps want to take because at the moment a lot of championship teams they have uh, premiership contract releases right yeah. premiership team comes for you your contracts you're, on, yeah. you're, go- you're gone I think there should be more compensation to these championship clubs if they're developing and bringing these talents through yeah. and maybe, I mean, what's there, 12 teams in in, um, in the UK, uh, in England, sorry? There's going to be players that slip through the net and championship guys can pick those up. Maybe it, Terence, perfect example. Leicester let him go, went to Doncaster, then ended up in the Mitre 10, slipped through the net, he's back and looked better than he's ever looked before. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer for these players to go. So I think the championship could be that development league and then every team that every player that they put through, they get financially compensated by the Premiership team. That's true. It's, yeah, it's a good way to look at it. I think there's just a lot. There's got to be something. Like yeah. Scott says that you'd never be able to just be like, yeah, Irish come up, or maybe even Irish healing Bristol stuff as well. We make it a massive league. We make it two conferences, um, and yeah, Championship just yeah. Just stay there, kind of things. Look after That's, yourself. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. It can't be like that because then, like, like you said, incentives, uh, money, all of that will just go by the wayside, and you'll lose a lot of good teams, a lot of you know teams that have got a lot of history and you know are a lot of people's local clubs and stuff like that. And that's you, that's one thing you don't want to get. Exactly, and the last thing we want, we touched on it with uh, Josh last <coughs> time, is another London World situation where. Yeah. These teams disintegrate. Yeah, 100%. That's what you don't want. You want more teams. You don't want less. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a very valid point that the Championship are trying to make. That if you take that dream away, almost that carrot. Yeah. Then what is there to fight for? Hundred um, percent. I mean, you may have your teams like um, your Nottingham's or your Hartbury or things like that. That yeah, it's a far off dream, but that's our goal. Like that's what we're aiming for. That's you know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not five years in time, but six, seven, eight years time, that's what we're building for. So you take that away, what's, what's, what's investors got? What's left, yeah. There was, I don't know if this was just someone's idea, or back, I think it was last year, there was talk of sort of putting um, a championship team and linking it to a premiership side. Okay. Um, and it would be after it's like uh, ring fence, so it would be, for example, Harper based basically lost this sort of way, so it would work like that. So, Guys, they would have smaller squads, and um, on the on the when it's like um, your LV Cup weeks or whatever, uh, your Anglo Welsh, they wouldn't have a championship game, and these players would get an opportunity to play on a bigger stage, so they would play in that team, and if they go well, they could move quite freely in between the two. Yeah. Because I think we we struggle when we are in the Premiership, like we can send out guys to go to championship teams, but they're not there the whole time. So it's difficult for them to go in and play as much game time as they need. Yeah. And then, but if there was a link between the two where you can move quite uh, freely, I think it would be um, a good way to get as many people playing as much as they can. Because you get a lot of, we've talked about it before, guys at Leicester that are sitting there at these big teams, well, well 
teams with big squads and they're not playing for anyone. They're, there's a lot of guys that travel, like traveling reserves to go to warm up in case someone gets injured in the warm up. And that's, they do that for like two or three years and they've lost out on rugby. Whereas if there was sort of a setup where they could still go to a team that was associated with them and play and not be someone coming from one system completely to another one and try to pick up the calls and not be there all the time, I think that would be quite beneficial. But yet again, you'd have to work out uh, the logistics of it all, and it's, it wouldn't be as easy as it as it sounds, sort of thing. But um, I think if the, if it did get ring fenced, that would be one way of looking at it. So players yeah. could, if they're not playing, they can drop down into this championship league, and it would be like a development league, almost like a sort of a, a league uh, equivalent, rather than having all these games sort of mixed around, you know. Because there's some ideas as well of um, changing when rugby's played, yeah. and kind of having like they do in the Southern Hemisphere, you've got your Super Rugby, but then you've also got your Minor Ten. And if you've got two high-level uh, leagues of rugby going on, one this time of the year, one this time of the year, then it's, it circles quite nicely. Yeah. And you're still high levels. Yeah. So, I mean, we're just three guys in an analysis room right now just chatting. But uh, <laughs> we're not going to we make any, any answers. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we don't have any answers. Uh, that was, uh, by the way, that one was from uh, James uh, on Twitter. Uh, who's uh, he's not got a last name? He's just kind of like Cher or Madonna. Uh, his uh, his uh, his Twitter handle is at aq aqua cat two aqua cat two. Go on, aqua cats. Sweet, right, guys. Uh, that's it. That's, it. that's episode right? two yeah. done. Thank you so much uh, for coming in and that's giving good. up your free time. Absolutely, um, enjoyed it. Great. Cheers. See you next time. Cheers. Oh, yeah. Episode number two is in the bag. Uh, thank you again so much to Scott Steele and Seb Chavez for taking the time out of uh, their incredibly busy schedule uh, to come and chat to us. Unfortunately, in this episode, we did not have a chance to speak about the move to Brentford. Uh, that was actually announced the following day. Uh, never fear, however, because we will be speaking about that in our next podcast. Uh, we'll be getting the reactions of the players and what they think of that. So uh, thank you again so much for listening. And for the next podcast, we will be sending out a tweet. Please tweet in your questions. As you can see in this one, we got through every single one, which was fantastic. Uh, but also let us know who you want on the podcast. And yeah, exactly. So, uh, and send in uh, your questions. And I hope you had a great day and enjoyed.